I got okay, got it. You got it. <clears throat> I can't remember what my question was this week. Um tell me anything about the other community. I answered that question. What's up, Sean? Hey, sir. Hey, buddy. <laughs> you see, I told you he could see. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you see, I put my glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that, that's, the, that's the trick. <laughs> I don't know where. Let me see if I can. I'm trying to pull it up. Because they text me. I had a question. Oh, I'll tell you, this is not good. Oh, I can't remember. Uh, mm. hey, damn, I can't remember. That's all right. Let's just pick up from where we were. Well, we last time. I had gotten up to, had I finished high school and gone to college? Um, hold on, let me. No, you were talking about them girls and then which one you really like and then the other one you went back to like and then you end up liking that one. And... The high school thing, right? Yeah. And then I took Wilma Brown to the prom. Yeah, and then you and then came, came from California. Okay, I think the question do you, does what vacations did you go on as a child or your first job? I can't remember which one. I didn't get either one of those. Well, yeah, I did my first job because I talked about my father getting me that job at uh, St. Elizabeth's. No, you didn't talk about that. Nope. That must be the answer. I think it's your first job. I thought I answered that. No, you talked about the uh, influences and you talked about cleaning houses and stuff like that, but you didn't specifically narrow down like a first job job. Well, the first job I got was at St. Elizabeth, well, first paying job I got, I got at St. Elizabeth's Hospital. And my father told me to go over there and apply. He told me where to go and everybody, you know what's funny about that? He was gonna get Carol a job over there. And Carol thought he had some influence and was gonna get her this job. And he brought home an application for her to fill out and turn, turn in or mail back in. And Carol was kind of disappointed because she thought he had some pull or something was gonna get her this job. And what he got her was an application. <laughs> But anyway, he told me to go over there. I went over there and applied and got the job. And I think that was in 1960. That was in 1961. Man, I had that job when we got married. Yeah. 61. And I, that was... That was probably, I always thought that was a pretty nice job. I was afraid when I first went over there because I knew the mentally ill were there and I didn't know what it was going to be like working with mentally ill patients. You know, I was a little afraid at first. And after we went in, I went into detached service. That's where I got all of my training. And from detach, I went to West Lodge. Didn't stay in West Lodge too long before they transferred me to East East Side East Side Service, and that was where I did all my remaining time. And you can see East Side Service from Alabama Avenue. There's two red buildings over there. One was seven building, one was four building, and I spent most of my time in seven building. 
But that, that, was a, that was a really nice experience because once I got comfortable, then I was able to stay on the ward by myself mm -hmm. with maybe 30, 30 or more patients. And I got really comfortable. I got comfortable enough that when I was working night shift, I could take a nap. <laughs> once the patients went to bed, I could take a nap. But there was always going to be some patient who didn't go to sleep. Mm -hmm. And that patient would come and warn me if the head nurse was coming. He'd come and wake me up. Say, mm -hmm. the nurse coming, supervisor coming, wake up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then they had, they like to play cards. So I play pinochle with them. Uh, we play bed with us. We had to take, we had to give them their medications and we had to uh, work with them whenever one got sick and the nurse had to come to, nurse or doctor had to come to the ward. We had to be there with them. And we had, it was interesting to take them to eat because you didn't, they didn't eat on the ward. They had to go to the cafeteria to eat. And you'd line all these patients up and walk them over to the dining area. And some of the stuff they would do on the way to the dining room was really just weird, right? Like one guy couldn't go through a door until he took his uh, index finger and tapped on every window pane. He had to tap on every window pane in the door before he could go through it, right? And I said, this, now I knew I was in the house then, right? <laughs> and then we had another patient he would, I don't know how he ever got to the dining room because he would take two steps forward and one step backwards and then to the side before he could go forward. That was his compulsion, right? And then you saw a lot of things. I saw a guy eat the bulbs off a Christmas tree. I saw another patient that I had to give an enema to. I gave him the enema and then took him to the, to the bathroom and when I had to go out and come back, and when I came back, he had eaten the results. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you see some stuff over there, right? And one patient stopped taking his medication. We had to put him in isolation. And when we put him in isolation, you, it's, it's an empty room. Nothing in there but window and door. And you can't give them any clothes or anything because you don't know what they're going to do with the clothing. And this guy just messed that room all up. I mean, he regurgitated all over the place. He pooped all over the place. And then he would be walking around, sliding around and everything. And then once he came down, we had to go in there and clean it up. So we had to get him out, put him in the shower, and then go and clean out that uh, isolation room. It was an experience. I mean, if somebody passed away, like when I worked on the geriatrics ward, if somebody passed away on your shift, you had to prepare them for the morgue. Oh, St. Elizabeth had its own morgue. So what you would have to do is you would have to lay them out flat, take their arms and cross the chest like, like this. And then you'd have to cross their feet at the ankle and you'd have to bathe them, shave them if they needed a shave. And then you'd take gauze and tie the arms and feet in place. And they told us that was so that when the undertaker came and got them, they didn't have to break any bones, you know, to set the, the body up for the casket and stuff. But I used to be really, I didn't like that. I wasn't too comfortable because a lot of times they would send somebody to help you put the body in the truck and take you over to the little morgue that they had. <clears throat> and then the guy would help you take the body out of the truck and, and help you put it in one of those baskets. So you had to search around in there to find an empty basket. So you open doors with bodies there, 
And then when you find an empty one and you slide the tray out, then you put your body on that, slide the tray in, and then you put that right on there who it is and stuff like that. And they only had one little ceiling light and that was a light bulb <coughs> in this little dark. So if they died at night, you halfway in the dark and that little dark morgue searching for a basket to put this body in, right? So nobody really liked that. that. That was not the best feeling. But it was, I had a good experience out there because we used to take them to a place near the laundry because they had their own laundry where they did the sheets and everything. And from there, you were looking directly at the Washington Monument, directly at it, up on a hill. Right now, Homeland Security is there. And we could look out and so every 4th of July, that was really nice. We take patients over there so they could see the fireworks. And they, they, that, was, that was exciting, they liked that. And I stayed out there until 66, 65, 66. And that's when old Charlie Payne came along. I don't know what we were doing, but he told me, he said, hey, Butch, we, why don't you come on out here with CIA with us out here in Langley? You know, he said, it's a nice job, make a little bit more money, you know, so. I had went down there on 10th Street. That's where their hiring was then. I mean, 16th Street. Went in there and got my little application. It was 17 pages. It was a 17 page questionnaire. Everything that they wanted to know about me. <laughs> and then I filled it out and I got the job, right? But before you could do anything at that job, you had to have an interview with a psychiatrist. And the psych and you had to take a poly, you had to take a poly test. But the psychiatrist, you know, he was he was pretty cool. I mean, he was asking me questions, sort of to see if I was going to tell the truth, <laughs> right? Because if I hesitated or stuttered, he would fill in the answer. Like when I was telling him that I went to, uh, 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 he said McKinley. I said, okay, yeah, McKinley. So he already knew. He was just gonna see what I was gonna say. And then he, he wanted to know if I had any interaction with foreign students. And I told him, well, no, I said, everybody I associated with was black. He said, didn't you go to DC Teachers College? I said, yep. He said, weren't there some foreign students there? I said, yes. He said, you didn't speak to them? I said, well, yeah, you know, we students, we were in class together. He said, then you had an interaction with foreign students, right? So they, that went through that. That was pretty, that was okay. That was interesting. And then the work out there was, it was mostly what we were doing in the office when I was out there. We were sending and receiving all these secret, top secret, stuff to go out to the agents in the field, wherever they were, a foreign country or wherever they were, right? So we were dealing with a lot of top secret, secret. Um, we had to have top secret clearance in order to do all that stuff. So we learned a lot about split transmissions, triple transmissions. I mean, stuff that they would cut in half, send one half one day and the other half maybe two or three days later. And then we would have to stamp it and make sure it got out. We would receive personal stuff from people if something happened to them in the field and their stuff came back, then we would have to make sure that got back to the family. It was a, it was a good job because everybody that I was in the office was, was in college. So we would get all the work done and then use the rest of the time to study or we would play poker with paper clips or ping pong. We had a ping pong ball in there. We played with that, you know, they didn't feel like studying and stuff like that. And then finally after that, we went to, then came DC teachers. Because when I graduated, 
the January that I, before I graduated, the school system came to DC Teachers College to recruit. And they hired me in January, even though I didn't graduate until that June. So when I graduated from college, I already had a job. Mm. So I left and went into the school system. And my appointment was at Deal Junior High School. I had never heard of a Deal Junior High School. Never heard it, didn't know where it was, didn't know nothing, right? But that's where I ended up. And then there was 27 years that I was there. Mm. That'd be a whole number of, you know, I, I did my practice teaching at Shaw Junior High School. And I didn't do much uh, practicing because the principal at that time, Percy Ellis said, I need you on the front door. And he said, don't you let anybody in here that doesn't belong in here. So he had me and this guy named Tommy Hopper. Our job was to be on that front door. That was when uh, Shaw Junior High School was on 7th Street, right? And I said, well, what about my practice teaching? He said, well, you can go up there a couple of days, take care of that. Don't worry about the supervisor, I'll take care of that part. So he would tell me when the supervisor was coming and I would have to prepare a lesson so that she could see me teach. And then as soon as that was over, right back to the front door, right? <laughs> right back to the front door, keep them, keep them thugs out of the school. That was our job, right? But I got through the practice teaching all right, and then I got uh, up to deal. And that's a whole, whole other thing. My, my major was special education. That's what I was supposed to be doing. I was supposed to be working with special ed students. And my minor was mathematics, or my concentration was mathematics. But when I got to deal, they had a principal, a white guy, a principal named Stutz. Mr. Stutz took me, he took me in his office and told me, we don't need you here. Mm -hmm. We don't have any special education students for you to work with. So he called downtown and tried to get them to move me. And downtown told him no, <laughs> that I had to stay. So he told me, well, I don't know what you're going to do. You, you find something to do, right? Because we don't have any special ed students. Well, they're white kids. There ain't no special ed white kids. Not up a deal. Okay. So... This black guy out there, black, they had a black assistant principal, Ralph Briscoe. And Briscoe says, still I'll tell you what, you just come go with me. You just hang out with me all day. So I hung out with him for, I guess I was with him for a year or two, just yeah. sort of being there watching, observing, and doing whatever he was doing, helping out wherever I could with the kids and doing lunch period and stuff, uh, playground duty and stuff like that. And then Stutz retired. And they brought in this guy named Warner, A. Lyman Warner. And things began to change because when Warner came, Warner was a liberal, real super liberal. <clears throat> and Warner didn't think that this school needed bells. He said, we don't need bells ringing around here all day long. He said, these people around here know how to tell time. They know when the class period is over. So they turned off the bells. And it was working all right for the students. The teachers couldn't handle no bells, right? So they had to put the bells back home because teachers couldn't handle that. The kids were fine with it, but teachers couldn't handle that, right? Then they came up with a lot of experimental kinds of programs. He hooked me up with a uh, psychology teacher at American University. 
And the psychology teacher wanted, well, first they gave me a program. He said, well, we're gonna, we're gonna put you in the classroom because I want you to run this particular program for me. Let's sort of oversee it. So what they did was they gave me a classroom. I think I had 15 students and they were low achieving students. And the students came in from American University and they wrote IEPs for those kids, the individualized instructional programs, right? For each student. And then those kids from American University, they would come in and work with those kids. So half would come in the morning and half would come in the afternoon. So I had two groups of kids. The morning kids would be there for English, math, and social studies. Then they would go to lunch and then they would go to their other subjects in the afternoon. And it was the opposite for the others. They'd go to their electives in the morning and then come to me in the afternoon. And that program worked pretty good. I mean, they evaluated the kids, did the kids report cards. They did just about everything, right? And then they wanted to let the kids design the room they wanted. So the kids came up, first thing they came up with, we're going to paint this room red, black, and green for mm. the, the African colors, right? So I said, yeah, fine with me. So we went out, got the paint, and got the kids and everything, painted the room red, black, and green, right? Then the your AU students came up with this. Well, they need a part of the room where if they don't feel like working, they can go back there and do whatever they want to do. So I said, fine with me, whatever you all want to do, because the uh, professor would come in and check on everything, see how everything is going, see how his students were performing their college assignments and stuff like that, all that kind of stuff. So they took some cabinets and desk and cordoned off a back part of the room because the room was rectangular. It wasn't really square-like. It was rectangular, it was a long room. And they had a little place back there where they could play music. You know, we got them a little record player. They could play music. They could go to sleep on the desk play games, they could do whatever, these are junior high school kids, right? And they could do whatever they want, but they had to keep the noise level low so that the other students who weren't going back there could do their work. I mean, well, that worked fine until all the teachers discovered how much fun those kids were having. And one of them came in and said, what in this is this ridiculous color to hit you all that painted this room, right? And, I, and then uh, a couple of the teachers didn't like the idea of those kids painting it those colors, right? So I had to tell them, well, this is not your room. Your room is down the hall or your room down on the first floor. See, you're a guest up here. So if you don't like the room, don't come up here, <laughs> right? So that worked for a while and then at the end, because that program only lasted a year. And then after that year, they sort of disbanded it. They wanted me to keep it for a little while, but then they said, okay, let's try something else. So they gave me a, a special ed room and identified some kids. But by this time, Julius Hobson, who was one of them civil rights people, he was raising hell all over DC about per pupil expenditures. And he felt like the people west of the park, west of Rock Creek Park, more money was being spent on them than east of the park. So they came up with this plan. We're gonna go east of the park and we're gonna go up to uh, Mount Pleasant, because at that time, Mount Pleasant had sort of moved from being mostly white to mostly black and Spanish, right? He said, we're gonna bus 
the kids from Bancroft Elementary School in Mount Pleasant. And then some kids from Upper 14th Street over to deal. So they put, they put places for these kids to come and get on the bus. And one of them was up there at 14th Colorado where those buses turned around. They would get on the bus. So we ended up with something like six bus loads of kids coming to deal from east of the park. And when they came in that school and they saw what was going on, they, they started raising cane. They were beating up the white kids and taking their money and just doing all kinds of stuff. Well, Warner wasn't doing no hell of a lot about it. You know, he was like, those kids will learn how to take care of themselves. They get tired of somebody taking their money <laughs> and they'll do something about it and stuff like that. Well, he was right because eventually they stopped. You know, they stopped with a little help, right? Because with them came the special ed kids. And that's when I started having students in special ed. Because at that time, special education was really behavior modification. It was really take these kids who have special needs and keep them away from the other kids in the other classrooms. So they'll stay in special ed all day long. Then the other teachers don't have to worry about them, right? So I did that for a while. And then they finally, Vince Reed, he was superintendent, along with the parents and everything. They decided that Mr. Warner had to go <laughs> because he didn't have discipline. The teachers were coming in and going, teachers would come in, sign in and go to lunch. I mean, go to breakfast and then come back later to do their classes, right? And they would be in the teacher's lounge, playing cards, drinking coffee and everything. I mean, it was a whole lot going on because Warner, he wasn't a disciplinarian. He wasn't strict, you know? And, and people were getting away with all kinds of stuff that they weren't supposed to be doing, right? Like, so downtown, Vince Reed came up there one day and he saw all that was going on, kids out in the halls and no bells and all this stuff. So they said, Warner got to go. So they got him out of there. And that's when they brought Reggie Moss, Tony Miners, and Ms. Bowman. They brought them in as a team to clean up the mess, right? Mm -hmm. They did, they came in, they cleaned up the mess. And they looked at me and uh, they said, well, what, what, what are you supposed to be doing? You know, it's so like, what are you gonna do? So I said, <clears throat> I told them what I had been doing, right? So they, they said, well, I'll tell you what, we're gonna make you Dean of Students. And your job is gonna be taking care of any problems that we run into with the students and the parents. And you don't have to worry about the teachers so much, but you're gonna be sort of like, well, what I ended up being was a buffer, a buffer between the teachers, the administration, the students and everything. So I really, that's what I, what I ended up doing essentially was if a kid got in trouble, it was up to the teacher to decide whether to send the kid to me or send the kid to the principal. If they send them to the principal, they had definite things. You do X, Y, and Z, you're going to get suspended. You're going home. If they send them to me, I had an option. I could keep them from getting suspended. I could keep them in my office or I could give them cafeteria duty or I could do some other things, right? So even if a teacher sent somebody to the principal, the principal had an option of sending the kid to me rather than they having to deal with it, right? And that would seem to work out pretty good. In fact, that's what I, that's what I basically ended up doing for almost what, 
20 years until uh, I went to Atlanta. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna work on my doctorate. Put a pause on that one, that's another story. <laughs> oh yeah, that's another story. But anyway, that deal experience, because that deal I ended up really, that's how I got into the ski club, the camping club, the equestrian club. I had to monitor all the dances that the kids wanted to have. Anything dealing with the kids and what they wanted to do or whatever their parents came up with what they wanted the school to do, that was my job. I would have to organize it. I'd have to be there to supervise it, all of that stuff. And then eventually that's when I got this thing to go to Atlanta. But the deal experience was, that was pretty nice. You know, I mean, I, I had fun. I had some good times, some bad times. I had to get rough with the kids, you know, it really get rough with some of them because <laughs> they were hard and they weren't going to do what you asked them to do. And I, you know, I, I would go visit their homes. Eventually, it got to the point where I was given the authority to suspend them, just like a, a, an administrator. And it would be up to me to decide whether a kid needed to go home or not. And sometimes I say, no, you're going out of here. Yeah, you go. I, I put them out for 10, 15, 20 days, and I don't want to see you. And then it got to the point where I felt like I, that wasn't really fair. Parents that I was dealing with, they couldn't really. So every time a kid got suspended, parent had to come up to the school to get them back in school. So I started getting to school at 6 o'clock in the morning. So the parent could come and have the conference with me and still go to work on time. So if they could get to work on time. If they couldn't do that, I would stay late after school and they could come after work. Right. And I got to know, you know, I got to got to, but by doing that, I my relationship with the parents got to be really great, especially with the black and Hispanic kids. The white kids, they they weren't they don't they weren't doing that much to to encounter me. None of that. Most of the stuff with the white kids was good time stuff. You know, they want to go roller skating or ice skating or stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. The black kids, they weren't used to stuff like those white kids were. They just didn't have those kinds of experiences. So. They were about dancers, but they took on me because the first time they had a school dance, all the black kids were standing around the wall looking at the white kids dance. And you know, those white kids couldn't dance. They'd be jumping around like how they do the and shit, you know. So, and the black kids would be laughing them and pointing, look at that, look at that, and tease them up stuff until I told them, I said, Well, you, you over here. They out there on the floor having a good time. Now, why, why are you over here? They not worried about you. Why, why are you worried about what they are doing? So finally the black kids start going out and doing their dances. And then the white kids start watching them and learning what the black kids were doing. And then I, next thing you know, when they had to dance, everybody was dancing, you know. And they, they, you know, it was, it was really a, it was a good experience. I don't remember some of the, I remember when they brought those damn computers in there. We knew nothing about a computer, nothing. They gave us three, three <coughs> thick manuals and told us take those home for the weekend, study that manual. So, because when you come back next week, and this was during the summer, that was another thing because I had worked during the summers because I didn't get off like teachers. I had to work just like the administration, right? And Miss Wise and I took those books, read those books. We didn't know what we were doing. I swear we didn't. And we had to keep running downtown to this guy called uh, Henry. 
then we knew a lot. And we were all, wow, we must have worried him to death. But how do you do this? How do you do that? So finally, we figured it all out. And once we figured it out how to do it, it was the easiest thing in the world. You just had to know what to do. <laughs> as long as you didn't know what to do, you were in trouble. But once we did it, we had to do what they call a master schedule, where you take those large manila folders, tape them all together, and then put seven columns for each period of the day. And then we had to sit down there with paper and pencil and write out everybody's schedule. All the teachers, when they're going to have lunch, when they're going to have planning, everything. The whole schedule for the whole school. And we got so we were masters at that. We had people calling us from other schools. How you do this? How you do that? I mean, we really got good at that thing. And that made it so much easier. Oh, that made it easier because even though we still had to do it on pencil first, but it was easy to transfer it from those cards to the computer. Because before they had the computer, you had to write out each kid's schedule. What that kid was going to take all day long, which period they were going to take it, which was going to be their lunch period for every kid. And we had over 900 kids. So you had to do all of that by hand. And the teacher's schedule, you had to do that by hand. All of that before they brought that computer in there. And once they brought that keyboard computer in, all you did was input the master schedule. Once you input the master schedule, then the, you put the kid's schedule in. You know writing now. You finished with all that writing and stuff. And the computer did everything else. It was really nice, you know. I enjoyed it after I figured out what to do. And let me see. Uh, you know, I did during, you know, during the summer when I had my motorcycle, I used to go up to Mount Pleasant during the summer and take the kids for rides through Rock Creek Park. Me and uh, Mr. Uh, Dawson. Mr. Dawson had a motorcycle also. Right? And when we come, when I did that during the summer, come back to that school in September, I was the greatest. Mr. Broaders came and took us for rides. He took us on his bike for rides. <laughs> and we would have things out back, you know, when they would have deal day. I would take them on motorcycle and ride them around that uh, playground out back. You know, I mean, I, I really had fun with them. Especially the camp, and the camping was really nice. Your mother went on a couple of the camping trips. And we slept in the tent. We even had a little portable potty and an air mattress. <laughs> I think that air mattress is still in the garage. I know that portable potty in there. Mm -hmm. And I know the tents are still upstairs in the attic somewhere. But we, it was a good experience. I, I'd do that all over again. That all right, we're going to have to call this one a session. <laughs> oh, OK. When they ran out of time. <laughs> yeah, we're at about an hour. There were 45 minutes to an hour. So I just wanted to keep them in bite-sized chunks. Oh, OK. So I can get them all transcribed and stuff. Well, that's good seeing you all. Good seeing you, too. Thanks for the story. It's good to hear you say that you would do it all again. Because not everybody feels that way about their life. Yeah, no, I would do it all. I would do my whole life basically again, if because I've I had, I had. Well, we'll do that next time. Okay. <laughs>